Well, good morning. That's probably all the sermon you need. You guys can. Some of the people are like, yeah, that's fine. Go home. Quick. It's good to see you today. So today I'm going to divide you into two groups by your choices that you're about to make. We're going to find out what kind of person you are. And it's based on grocery bags. And so, um, I, I don't know about you, but I have a collection of grocery bags that are stored inside of grocery bags at my house. That's called being an adult, apparently. You get grocery bags, and you have so many that you put grocery bags in grocery... Anybody have that at home? Am I the... Okay, good. All right. So, um, but if you're like me, you, you fill your car with groceries, you go to the grocery store, and then you get home, and... Uh, you know, you got eggs, you got milk, you got breakable things, you got bread in there, and uh, canned goods, uh, frozen goods, rock hard things, and you have a decision to make. And if you're like me, something in your brain says, this is a competition, and your goal is to see if you can get every bag somehow on your hands, in your arms, every single bag, and see, no matter what's in them, if you can carry them all into the house. Is anybody else in that group? You're in that group? Okay, you're my people. I appreciate all you psychotic people. Now, the problem is, and I'm going to show you what the problem is, and, and right now we're going to we're going to openly, since you're my people here, many of you, we're going to openly confess our sins, and so be careful, because here we go. How many of you, because you did that, have either broken or dropped something because you tried to do a world's record, right? Okay. By the way, to feed my addiction, Michelle brought me this little handy-dandy thing so I can actually carry more things on my hand you're feeding my... That's called enabling. You realize that, right? There's a, there's a book on that. It's called Boundaries. We'll get it for you. But I'm looking forward to using this. By the way, they actually had a guy, I don't know if you read this story, who did that and actually lost one of his fingers because apparently he like overdid it, I guess. I don't know. He must have had some other issues, I'm hoping, because <laughs> now I'm like, my finger's a little... Oh, no. Right? So it's funny how you think of those stories after. But here's the deal. We've all done it, and, and most of us have done it, where, you know, even if we were carrying eggs, that's an egg crate in the bottom there, even if we were carrying eggs or we were carrying something soft and we had canned goods, you know, we'd get mad if uh, uh, the bag boy or bag girl threw cans on top of our eggs. But how many times have we walked in the house, have no idea what's where, and just plopped it on the countertop, having no idea if can just, yeah, you've done that too. If the can went through the bread, you know, you got a couple flat, and you, you try to straighten out the bread so your wife doesn't notice. You've done that one before? That's always a fun one. What's wrong with the bread? No idea. I think it must have happened at the store. <laughs> By the way, that doesn't work at Aldi because you bag your own groceries, so then you have to yell at yourself. You don't get a choice. Now, here's where I said all of that. So we've been talking about the book of Nehemiah, and we're looking back thousands of years to principles, biblical principles, that still apply today. And I want to give you, listen, so here, here's the thing. If you're not careful, you get so busy in life. You get so busy trying to get from, that you forget what's really important. So, so I want to encourage you today, if you don't remember anything else that I say today... I want you to say, God, make me a one-bag Christian. And I want your one bag to be, I'm going to live for Christ. Now, there's things you're going to do if that's your bag, if that's what you want to do. And by the way, in the 60s, they used to say, is that your bag, man? You remember that? I, I kind of remember that. I, oh, you're a liar. <laughs> so... You're not supposed to lie in church. You're supposed to wait till right after. When your wife says, what was the sermon about? And you go, Jesus. <laughs> My entire childhood was based on that. But, but here's the deal. I, 
I think in life we get so busy with so many things. Listen, some of you got busy on the way to church today, and you haven't even had time to slow down to thank God for today. You haven't had time to read your Bible, which I understand. You, maybe you were in a hurry or something happened. But the truth is, even worse than that, we get on the way places, and we think life is about from getting from one place to the other, and we're not worried about what we break in between. And instead, if we would say, Jesus, I want you to be first in all of my life, then it changes how we drive. It changes how we treat our family members. It changes how we treat our neighbors. It changes how we think about life. And, and so often we're just trying to accomplish so many things and carry everything at once, and we forget that the most important thing is not the amount of things we carry. By the way, in America, it's become a status symbol when somebody says, uh, uh, I know you're busy. We like to say yes. I had a guy text me this week and he said, I know you're busy, but I wanted to see if I could line up a lunch. I said, no, I'm not busy. I'm just lazy. Freaked him out. He didn't know what to reply to that. Does that mean you have time for lunch? I don't know, right? But I thought I'd just throw that out there for you. So today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to look at this big picture of Nehemiah and I'm going to give you Three things that all are under the umbrella of as Christians in the New Testament. Am I a person who's doing what God wants me to do? Nehemiah was able to restore the walls of Jerusalem after all of this captivity. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All that stuff that happened as they were dragged out of Jerusalem. And now they've come back and he out of... This is now the third time they've tried to rebuild the walls. And these are... Three of the reasons why I believe that Nehemiah succeeded when other people failed. So we're going to pick up here and we're going to talk about this whole idea of how we can get on track. So this is the summary of the whole series. So here we go. Number one, honor God and admit sin. And I'm going to talk about what that means in a second, but, but let me just read this passage. Then I said... Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. Now listen to what he says next. This is big. For your servants, the people of Israel, I confess the sins. Now listen, they were in a a land that was run by pagans. They were in a land where they were oppressed by a horrible government. And he could have easily prayed, Lord, these Babylonians, boy, they're awful. These people we're living with, they're terrible people. But, but he says, that's, that's not my job. Who am I looking at? We, your people. And then he continues, including myself and my father's family have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly to you. We have not obeyed the commandments, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. So what is Nehemiah doing first? Instead of looking out at what everybody else is doing wrong, by the way, we have a tendency to do that. It makes us feel better about ourselves when you look at other people and say, man, at least I'm not as dumb as they are, right? So, and, and by the way, the news encourages us to do that. They encourage you to be afraid or angry, right? And so how do they do that? Well, everybody else is an idiot and you're a genius. I know many of you, we got some geniuses in here, but not all of the time, right? Right? Even the smartest people in here have broken eggs because they tried to carry all the bags, right? So, so, so here's the deal. Uh, Nehemiah looks and there's all kind of things he could confess about other people, but he says, no, 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 that's not where I start. I start here. God, I've messed up. God, my family's messed up. Uh, the Israelites have messed up. Now, there, were plenty, there was plenty of, of things he could have thrown at other people, but he knew that true humility starts by looking at ourselves. Now, I want to say something to teenagers today, and if you have teenagers, you can teach them this lesson, because this is huge. Okay, and this is whether they're Christian or not. Maybe your kids aren't, you know, maybe your neighbor's kids aren't. But here's the truth. Selfishness and self-centeredness will ruin your life. And kids today, when we were kids, people wanted to uh, uh, have, you know, they wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor. Now, kids want to be, you ready for this? Famous. Number one goal. Famous. Before rich. 
famous. They want to be famous. I guess they figure everything else goes with it. And so here's the truth. If you're not careful, we become selfish and self-centered. But the truth for all of us is that it's very easy for all of us to become selfish and self-centered. It's easy to go through life thinking, life is about me, my, the big change in my life. I still remember when I came to Christ and surrendered my heart to Him was the way I quit thinking so much about me. And I started seeing that God cared about other people. Nehemiah starts by saying, we've blown it. We've not been faithful. We've not honored God. Listen to what it says in the New Testament, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so John is trying to contrast our unfaithfulness with God's faithfulness. So what does unfaithfulness mean? Unfaithfulness is a man who goes to the beach with his wife and watches other women. Well, you got that illustration, didn't you? We understand that, and yet we don't think a thing about what God, who is, if we're Christians, God should be our eternal date. <laughs> and what are we looking at? What are we watching? What are we filling our minds with? And the truth is, we have to take time to say, God, forgive me for the unfaithfulness in my life. And the good news is, the Bible says, even when we're unfaithful, He is faithful. And He forgives. And can I tell you something about forgiveness? You don't deserve it. The Bible's totally unfair. Why? Because <laughs> God gives us forgiveness when we don't deserve it. That's what it's about. So when Nehemiah says, God, forgive us our sins, those are prayers God's answers. By the way, if you notice the story with Jesus, when he goes and the one guy is praying and he's saying, God, thank you that I'm not like that guy. And that guy is praying, God, forgive me. And Jesus said, God's hearing that prayer. So make sure that when you're praying and when you're living and when you're looking that you're not so busy judging and looking at everybody else and saying, boy, those people are really messed up, that you don't look in the mirror and go, but for the grace of God, I'd be right there. God, help me not to make life about me. Do you realize Nehemiah sacrificed what would have been a fairly easy life in order to rebuild the walls. I mean, he was in the castle or, or the palace. Now, granted, his job was a little dangerous. He was a, a wine taster for the king. But as long as you knew where the wine came from and followed it all the way there, it's a pretty good setup. And if you're a wine drinker, you're thinking, unlimited wine, not a bad job. And yet Nehemiah said, God, what do you want me to do? I love Number two, and we'll give a quote in a minute. Speak his truth and pray for strength. Now, why is it important to speak his truth and pray for strength? Because as we go through life, we all become weak. We all get tired. And by the way, everybody gets tired of doing what's right. If, you're think you're, if you think you're the only one who's tired of doing, who's watching people who do everything wrong seem to do better, God has no, that has always been true all through scripture. And yet, as we go through life, if, if, we're, if we're not careful, we'll think, well, it's so far. I love movies. And movies have something in the middle of them called a montage. And a montage typically is where they make time pass and they play music and they have a bunch of little scenes. And one of the best ones and easy ones to remember is a pretty famous movie that maybe you've seen, maybe not, but it's got a song called Perfect Day, and I actually like that song. And the song is literally about a totally selfish and self-centered person that gets up at noon and can't figure out, uh, you know, why life, you know, this is going to be a great day because life revolves around me. And it's from a movie called Legally Blonde. I know. Blockbuster. Lots of awards it should have received, right? But the truth is, how does a movie start? They're showing you weeks, months in this person's life, what? To give you an idea of how they got from point A to point B. I want to let you know that every day you make a choice about whether you're going to pursue what God wants you to 
whether you're going to say, Jesus, I, my life is going to revolve around you, or if you're going to make life about everything, all your worries, all your frustrations, all your fears, all the other things you try to carry around and ruin the one thing that God has given you and follow him. So let's look at what happens next in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6, here's what happens. Nehemiah gets attacked. Somebody begins lying about him. They send an open letter to lie about Nehemiah and what he's doing. So Nehemiah doesn't just say, well, I guess it's too bad. No, Nehemiah says this, I sent him this reply, nothing like what you are saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. If you think you're the only person in the world coming up against obstacles, this is thousands of years ago, and Nehemiah has to pray for strength. Why? Because somebody is lying about him and attacking him. And by the way, when an enemy attacks you sometimes, you know what it does? It makes you tired. It makes you frustrated. You, you can wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, by the way, you ever have something happen years ago and you woke up in the middle of the night thinking about it again? <laughs> and so Nehemiah is dealing with somebody attacking him and he says, hey, that's not true. God, would you give me strength? When's the last time that you prayed that God would strengthen you in an area of your life? Is there a struggle that you have? When's the last time you said, God, would you give me strength in this area? Would you give me strength with this person? Would you give me strength in this situation? God, would you help me as I deal with this? And confess to him. Be honest, just like that first step. God, you know I struggle in this area. Lord, you know I struggle with anger, with frustration, with this. But Lord, would you give me your strength? In Psalms 37, I love this psalm. Somebody sent me this week. This week. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. Why? For like the grass, they'll soon wither. Like green plants, they'll soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. There's another verse in the New Testament that says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So basically, just do what's right. When something goes wrong, when people accuse you, just do what's right. And then it continues. Dwell in the land, enjoy safe pasture, take delight in the Lord, and what will happen? He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will do this. He'll make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. This is David. Did you know David never wrote a psalm about defeating Goliath? I would have written a hundred. I'd have like, you know, I'm only four feet tall. Right? I mean, it'd be some great... But, but you know what he wrote over and over about? Confessing sin. Trusting God. Understanding that God is all-powerful and almighty. And the truth is, when you get weak and you get tired and you need God's strength, one of the first things you can do is say, God, I know you can handle this. And then say, God, I need your strength. Listen to this quote. I love this by Andy Stanley. If you decide that what God is asking you to do with your life is just too much on you and it's a little too inconvenient, then you'll never see the miracles he has for you. Nehemiah had to get out of his comfort zone in order to lead God's people to where they needed to be. And the truth is, in order for you to lead your family, in order for you to, to be an example at work, in order for you to be the person God wants you to be, it's going to be uncomfortable sometimes. It's going to be difficult sometimes. It means changing. It means asking God to work on you. It means confessing sin and making things right. But it also means, God, would you give me your strength? Because it's only through God's strength that you can do those things. Number three, last but not least, embrace Scripture, and of course in the New Testament, and Jesus. When I think of that montage at the beginning or in the middle of movies where they move time along, I think of people asking me the question, well, how did you become a pastor? And I think they're expecting that I was one day walking down the street and it was like, the voice from above, build an ark. And people think that somehow that, that God just spoke to me from a cloud one day or, or, you know, split the Red Sea or whatever. It definitely didn't help me to catch fish. I wish Robert was here today. He knows that. 
The truth is, when I look back, how did I become a pastor is I, when I became a Christian, somebody said, what my youth pastor said, hey, could you lead a Bible study for four or five junior hires? I said, okay, I have no, what I'm, no idea what I'm doing. He said, here's a book. I, those kids were bored. To, I am sure those kids to this day are like, that was the most boring Bible study ever. And then when I got into college, I volunteered at a youth group and I started helping with a youth group and, and took kids on trips and started working with youth group and started doing little messages on Wednesday nights and that whole deal. Some of the parents of that youth group, by the way, were here just a few weeks ago from 35 years ago, still in touch with them. And then after that, what happened? I, I was teaching school, and while I was teaching school, I had a teaching degree. I was On the weekend, I was leading a small group of high school kids, and I was having a Bible study with them. And then I had a church call and say, would you come be our youth pastor? And I thought, well, I got nothing better to do. The school just fired me. So that's what I did. By the way, don't be surprised when God gives you a push from one end and he's pulling you from another. It's not always just a pull. Sometimes he'll give you a push. Like, hey, do you want to come? Oh, by the way, you're fired. What? And so that's how I first became a youth pastor. And then I did that for quite a few years. And then after that, I had one of my mentors say to me, have you ever thought about pastoring a church? I literally laughed at him, which maybe you should give him a call and ask him what was wrong with him doing that. I said, who would want me to be their pastor? I literally said that to him. It was a step at a time. It was a moment at a time. And the truth is, if God's going to use you, it's not typically going to be these huge leaps and bounds where you wake up one day and you have a voice from heaven. It's typically going to be because you were faithful. You spent time in the Bible. You spent time in prayer. You asked God to give you strength in those little things so that when the big things came along, you were a little better at making choices. And maybe you messed up sometimes, but you learned how to confess and make it right and say, God, give me strength to do it again. In Nehemiah 8, it says, Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. As he opened it, the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded. Yep, yep. I, if you missed a few weeks ago, I talked about that. Then they bowed to the ground, worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law of God. Listen making it clear and giving it meaning so the people understood what was being read. And I would tell you this from that ancient passage from the, all these thousands of years ago, when you read the Bible, ask God, God, would you help make it clear to me? I would much rather you read one verse and spend some extra time, maybe in the book of John in the New Testament, just read one story a day rather than try to read a whole chapter or a whole book of the Bible in a hurry and having no idea what you just read. I heard a comedian years ago say, I got a mind like a steel sieve. So you might call that a colander. A strainer. Instead of a steel trap, it's a little bit more loose. And so, especially for you, getting one verse that you focus on and say, God, would you help me to roll that over in my mind, to meditate on it. In 2 Thessalonians, it says it this way. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm, hold fast to the teaching we passed on to you. By the way, that's the opposite of the 38 special song. Instead of holding on loosely, when it comes to the Bible... I mean, maybe that works for relationships, but when it comes to the Bible, hold on tight. Whether by word of mouth or letter, may the Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loved us by His grace give us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. I hope that when you come on Sundays and you hear God's word and it's explained to you and we do our best to make it clear that as you read it, your heart is encouraged. That you're inspired. That he strengthens you. That God works in you. Hold on to the teaching. John 3.16 gives the main idea of what it means to be a one-bag believer. For God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish. But have eternal life. 
when you get busy in life, when you get overwhelmed in life, Jesus, thank you that you love me. Jesus, I want to believe you. That word belief is the word for faith. That word for faith literally means to trust in. It's what you do when you sit in a chair. Lord, I trust you. So when you find yourself struggling, when you find yourself frustrated, when you find yourself weak, go back to that place and say, God, thank you that you love me. I trust you. One of my favorite prayers is to pray, God, I don't always understand you, but I trust you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step to surrender is to say, Jesus, I need you. I know you died for me because I'm a sinner, I'm messed up, I'm broken, I confess my sin to you, and I surrender my life to you. I want to follow you the rest of my life. So if you've never done that, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what that means. Maybe today you'd say, I want to give my life to Christ. Or if you're here and maybe years ago you gave your life to Christ, but boy, you've been carrying a lot of bags that you think are important. Maybe it's time to say, you know what, God, as many things as I have to do, as many priorities as I have, Lord, I come back to making you first. And I want to walk with you first in my life. You can make that commitment right where you're at today. We're going to pray and then I have our time of offering with a closing song. So would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this story that's thousands of years old, inspired in your word that reminds us, Father, of what you can do through just one person. And Lord, there's people in here who through the example that you're putting in their hearts, through the change you're doing in their lives, generations will be changed. Their children, their grandchildren, their nephews, their nieces, their neighbors will be changed because they see the truth of your power in their lives. Father, may we day by day trust you and surrender to you. Thank you for this time today in Jesus' name. Amen.